you have your Bible with you this morning, please open to Paul's letter to the Ephesians. This morning we'll be looking at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. As you find your way there, um, a brief note, while I was in Kansas City, I was at Faith Community Church. Um, I got to sit under the preaching and teaching of Logan Cawthon, and when Brother Logan preached through this section. He did it in three sermons. I couldn't bring myself to to break it up into three sermons, so by God's grace, we will cover the entirety of the uh, ten verses, and I will try to be mindful of your time. Having found your place in Scripture, would you please stand for the reading of God's Word? Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Verse 4, But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up, with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Praise be to God for his word. You may be seated, and as you sit, I will pray for us. Father, this morning, we ask that you would open our eyes. Father, that you would enlighten the eyes of our hearts that we may know what is the hope to that which you have called us to. Father, may your words ring true and nothing more than your words. Father, be with us, we pray. Amen. Jonathan Edwards is a name that many people are familiar with. Many of you um, probably know something of him, or you've at least heard the name. Edwards was, or is, known as the great American theologian. Right? We can look at lots of people in church history, but we have one. Right? We have Jonathan Edwards. And this morning I want to read you an excerpt from... His most famous sermon, it's the sermon that in many ways fueled and sparked the first great awakening in the 18th century. The sermon is entitled, as you probably know, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Edward says, and I quote, The bow of God's wrath is bent, and the arrow made ready on the string, and justice bends the arrow at your heart, and strains the bow, and it is nothing but the mere pleasure of God and that of an angry God without any promise or obligation at all that keeps the arrow one moment from being made drunk with your blood. Thus, all you who never passed under a great change of heart by the mighty power of the Spirit of God upon your souls, all you that were never born again and made new creatures and raised from being dead in sin to a state of new and before altogether unexperienced light and life are in the hands of an angry God. End quote. Now that is a very sobering picture. And it's a shame that Edwards is 
in many ways only remembered for this sermon. For if you were to read Edwards, this is one of the outliers. For Edwards often spoke of the kindness and the gentleness and the meekness of Christ. The willingness to receive men with open arms. And typically, when this is read, some of you perhaps read it in um, public school, maybe in history class or in literature class, the people, the, 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 the teachers will say, look, these Puritans, they were nothing more than hellfire and brimstone preachers, and they were a bunch of lunatics. Well, if you finish the sermon, you'll know that that's not true, because Edwards makes very clear that though God does not tolerate sin, and His justice will be satisfied, He stands ready to extend grace and mercy. Edwards in many ways, it seems, gets it right. right. Because the question is not, do we like what Edward says? Whether you like it or you don't like it doesn't really matter. The question is, is it true? Is it true? That's the question we have to wrestle with. And I would argue that in light of what we will see this morning, it is true because Edwards, I think, understood what in many ways we have forgotten here in America, the church in the West, is that before we can rightly understand the good news, we have to understand the bad news. It would be, it's like, gentlemen, you remember the day you went to the jewelry store to pick out that beautiful engagement ring for your bride-to-be, right? And when you walked in, you probably went over to one of the cabinets and it had a bunch of diamonds and they were probably on these white little trays. And you first walk in, you're like, that's a $5,000 rock. There ain't nothing special about that. It's just a rock. You dug that out the dirt. Probably spit on it, shined it up. Right? When you talk to the gentleman, he'll use his flattering words to try to convince you to buy this one or that one. But then, right, he'll take that one tray out. He'll set it on top of the glass top. He'll put on his white gloves. And then he'll pull out this little tray. And that tray has black felt on the bottom of it. And then he might use his little tweezers and he'll grab it and he'll put it on the black felt, and as soon as he does, bam, right, every single light beam in the air just hits that thing, and it's dazzling, it's sparkling. Well, what changed? Well, the diamond itself didn't change. It was the backdrop that changed to help you see clearly the beauty and the preciousness that is in that stone. And that is what we are going to see today in Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. Because verses 1 through 3, they're not comfortable. We don't like them. But Paul makes clear who we were apart from Christ. To give you a little bit of context about Ephesians, right? It's written to the church in Ephesus. Um, As you well know, it is a port city at its time, right? It's a hot spot for pagan worship. You have lots of people coming and going, right? They have the Temple of Artemis, one of the ancient wonders of the world. And Paul, right, we learn from the book of Acts, spends three years ministering here. And in his first chapter to this church, right, he opens with a greeting and reminds the churches of the blessings that are found in Christ through redemption and his pastoral prayer for them is that the eyes of their hearts might be opened, that they might know the hope that is in the calling of Christ and the immeasurable riches of his glory. And so then we get to chapter 2. And Paul begins by laying out the bad news, who we once were apart from Christ, the black felt, if you will in order to highlight the glory of God in His sovereign handiwork of salvation in verses 4 through 10. So what we will see are the two states of mankind. And my purpose in preaching to you this morning, my hope, is twofold. For you, believer, to glory in the grace and mercy of God. And for you in this room who do not know Christ, for you who are apart from Christ, for you to turn to Jesus Christ in faith. And if you get nothing else out of this, if you decide to tune me out before we get to verse 4, before we get to the but God, you will leave here with the, well, this guy's just a hellfire and brimstone guy. 
So if you don't get anything else, I hope you understand this, that God reconciles individuals to himself as an act of grace. So let's take a look. Two states of mankind. The first is this, that the state, we have the state of man apart from Christ. Look with me at verse 1. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which, in which you once walked. First thing we see is that man is dead. That's D-E-A-D with a capital D. We're not struggling. We're not sick. We're not just in need of some help. Dead. Like the corpses in the water during the Titanic. We're not the dude drowning, getting ready to get on the lifeboat. You, you and I, apart from Christ, we are the corpse. Gone. This is what happened in Genesis 3. Right? God gave man a commandment in the garden. He said, do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And for perpetual obedience, he promised life. And in disobedience, he promised death. And as you and I know, Adam fell and we in him. And he was cast out. And though he did not die physically, he died spiritually. And throughout the Old Testament, we are reminded that to be dead or to be associated with dead things is to be cut off from God, his community, and his promises. We are outside of the covenant of God's grace. This is a sobering picture. Because Paul just got done telling the church in chapter 1, starting in 22, he said, And he, God, put all things under his, Christ's feet, and gave him as head over all the things to the church, which is his body, and the fullness of him who fills all in all. Hallelujah, somebody. And then he says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. He cuts right to the heart. This is who we were, dead. Not just dead, but dead in sin and trespasses. All right, sin, any lack of conformity to or transgression of the law of God. A simpler way to put it is rebellion against God. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. We were running away. Look at verse 2, in which you once walked. This is a common metaphor that Paul and some of the other New Testament writers use during the first century, right? To walk is a metaphor used um, to speak of one's daily life, how we conduct our daily affairs. It incorporates all of life, all that we do, all of who we are. And Paul is making clear that apart from Christ, we are dead in trespasses and sin, and it was all of our life. Every breath, every step, everything. You see, we often think of sin as just our outward actions. But that's only half true, right? Those are the sins of commission, right? The things that we do. We often forget the sins of omission. It's the things that we do not do. All we have to do is think of the first and greatest commandment that Jesus gave to the Pharisees when they asked him, what is the greatest commandment? He said, you are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. We don't do that by nature. So we are guilty of breaking the law and we are guilty of not keeping the law. And so the issue that Paul is laying before the Ephesians is that man is dead and in need of a resurrection but notice, he's saying these in the past tense. Were. He's writing to who he assumes are believers. And so I want you to know, church, that if you are a believer in Jesus, if you are following Christ, this is who you were. It's no longer who you are. But if you are outside of Christ this morning, instead of were, you should say are. Are. So we see that man is dead. Secondly, we also see that man is enslaved. 
Look at me at the latter half of part uh, verse 2, right? We were dead in our sins and trespasses in which we once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. We were enslaved. And Paul brings to the forefront the three great powers that keep people in bondage to sin, which are the world, the devil, and the flesh. We see first the world, right? Following the course of this world. Now, the word world is an interesting word. It's in Greek, it's cosmos. And it can be used many different ways. And so we have to ask, okay, what does the author mean when he says world? Um, because John uses it a handful of ways in his gospel. And so what does Paul mean here? Sometimes it means the physical earth. Sometimes it means um, peoples without distinction. Um, it can mean all nations. Um, but here, Paul is using it to um, undergird and to explain the wicked and godless system that surrounds all humanity. And so he says we were following the course of this world. Prior to Christ, we were just going along with the spiritual disposition of all fallen mankind. We didn't care. Following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air. Apart from Christ, it's not just that we were just floating along. It's that you were actually, you and I were actually following Satan himself. We, you may not have been a Satanist, but Paul makes clear to live in rebellion to God is to live in obedience to Satan and his cronies. Right? He, he calls him the prince of the power of the air. It's an interesting title given to him. Um, right? The accuser has many titles throughout the Bible. He goes by the accuser, the devil, Satan. We could go on. But here he is called the prince of the power of the air. It speaks of his authority within um, the spiritual realm and the domain that he has. And so make no mistake, brother and sisters, that Satan is at work. It says we are following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Satan is at work where? In the sons of disobedience. Well, who are they? We'll look at the beginning of verse 3. Among whom we all once lived. Before you came to know Jesus Christ, it was you. It was me. It is those outside of Christ presently. Not only were we following the course of this world, nor were we, not were we only following the devil, but we are also following our flesh. Look with me again at verse 3. Among whom we all once lived, live, lived in in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. We were dominated by our passions and our flesh apart from Christ. And Paul makes it clear here by including this that we cannot blame our sin on the devil or the world. Your hand is in the pot just as well. Right, Following our, our passions of the flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, it is the twisted perversion of desires of all mankind. It's taking a good thing that God has made and twisting it and perverting it. That is how we once lived. Because God made everything in six days, he made it good. And when man fell, he began to twist that which was good. God made man and he made woman and within the covenant of marriage, sexual union is a beautiful thing but mankind and his carnal desire twists that into pornography and despicable images. God gives grapes and man makes it into wine, right? The Psalms tells us that God give, gave wine to gladden the hearts of men. It's a good gift from God. God. I don't know if we can say that in a Baptist church, but that's what the Bible says, right? It's a good gift from God to be used properly. What does man do with it? He perverts it. He overuses it. He uses it in ways that God did not intend. This is what 
we are apart from Christ. This is what we do. Right? James puts it this way in James 1.14. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Brothers and sisters, the devil is at work. But apart from Christ, ultimately who is to blame? Us. We are guilty. We don't get to point the finger and say, Satan made me do it. No, he didn't. Where does sinful desire arise from? From the human, unconverted, stony heart. We sinned because it was our nature. Paul puts it this way in Romans 3, 10 through 18, as he quotes the Old Testament over and over again. He says, as it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks after God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good. Not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes." Jeremiah 17, 9 puts it this way, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can utter it? Man is depraved. He is dead and he needs to be made alive. This is exactly why God destroyed the earth with a flood in Genesis 6. Genesis 6, 5, it says, The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that the intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Disney says, follow your heart. Bible says, apart from Christ, your heart is desperately wicked. What happens when you follow your heart? Apart from Christ, nothing good. You see, apart from God and Christ and the working of his Holy Spirit, we are a dark and evil people. Paul again puts it this way in Romans 8, 5 through 8. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their mind on the things of the Spirit. For to set their mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. That is a shocking statement. But it is the word of God. People of God, do you want to know what compels a man to go into Columbine High School in 1999 to shoot it up? or to Uvalde, or to a theater in Aurora? Do you want to know what compels a man or a woman to mutilate their bodies and claim to be contrary to what God made them? It is this. It is the depravity of man. It is their, the working out of their sinful hearts, being compelled and influenced by the world and by the devil. And our hearts should break for them. So we see that man is dead. We see that man is enslaved. And also we see that man is condemned. Look with me again quickly at verse 3 towards the latter half. And were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. This is the part where people even in the pew begin to get squeamish. Because we don't like that. Why has the church become unsalty in many ways? It is because we fail to realize who man is. We think too much of ourselves. We fail to acknowledge that all men stand guilty before a holy God. Children of wrath. 
right? Popular society rails against this idea. It will not stand for you to say that all men are accountable to the one true God, that they will give an account. Nobody cares if you just get in your car, drive to church on Sunday, as long as you keep it to yourself. They don't even care if you talk about Jesus as long as he's nice, happy, clappy, and loves everybody. But the moment you assert that every man, woman, and child will stand before the final judge and give an account, that's when people have an issue. And it's ironic because we are living in a culture that cries out against injustice, but nobody wants the justice of God. Right? Even within so-called Christian circles, we've begun to forsake this idea that every man is guilty. Right? We want to do away with the notion that all men are guilty and stand before a holy God. And so we, we take truths of the Bible and we twist them and we pervert them again. Right? We rip what it means when the Bible says that God is love and we blow that far out of proportion. Instead of God being holy, he's just love. He's like your grandpa sitting in his recliner. He's sweet, he's kind. But we don't ever talk about his attitude towards sin. You see, the Bible talks about God's love in multiple ways, but it, it speaks about it generally in two ways. You have God's general love for all of creation. right? God made everything. He so he loves all of creation in a general way, right? He makes the rain to fall on the righteous and the unrighteous. So in that way, yes, God loves all people. God, the Bible also speaks about God's salvific love. The love that saves. This is where people will pervert this. And it sounds like this. God loves all people equally and unconditionally. God's disposition towards all men at all times and all places is that of love. Once again, he's like your grandfather. Well, that sounds nice. The question is, is it true? Is that true? Well, let's examine what the Bible has to say. Malachi 1 to be, is what we'll call it, halfway through. I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated. Psalm 5, verses 4 through 6. For you are not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil may not dwell with you. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all evildoers. You destroy those who speak lies. The Lord abhors the bloodthirsty and deceitful man. Psalm 7, verses 11 through 13. God is a righteous judge and a God who feels indignation every day. If a man does not repent, God will wet his sword. He has bent and readied his bow. He has prepared for him deadly weapons, making his arrows fiery shafts. No doubt that is reminiscent of Jonathan Edwards. Psalm 11, verse 5. The Lord tests the righteous but his soul hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. That's the Bible. That's the Bible. R.C. Sproul put it this way. He said, I can think of no more pernicious a lie to destroy people's souls than this, that God loves you unconditionally. R.C. Sproul says, no, he does not. If we do not meet the condition that he established for us in creation, God will send us to hell forever. That is what the Bible says, even though the culture does not like it. God requires perfect obedience. Unless the condition is met, none of us will step into the courts of heaven unless the terms of the covenant of creation are kept Perfectly, we will rendezvous in hell where we justly belong because of our disobedience. God does not love all people unconditionally without exception. He loves everyone generally. He loves those he redeems in Christ specifically. 
And that is a hard truth to swallow. But that is reality. And by now, you are wondering, Cody, what about grace? What about mercy? Where is the kindness of God? If you've tuned me out or you're getting ready to get up and walk out, you're going to leave and say you're just a hellfire and brimstone guy. You preach a God that has no mercy. Look at verse 4 with me. But God, being rich in mercy... Because of the great love with which he loved us. This, brothers and sisters, is the second state of man in Christ. And this will go somewhat quickly. Look at verses 4 and 5. The first piece of the fivefold condition of man in Christ is that man is made alive. And we see a couple of things here. God being rich in mercy. Does God hate sin? Yes, he does. But God is rich in mercy. Remember with me Exodus 34 when Moses said, Lord, let me see your glory. And the Lord said, to paraphrase him, right, Moses, I'll literally melt your face off, so I'm going to put you in the cleft of the rock. I will put my hand over you. I will have all of my goodness pass before you. And then you can see my backside, or the the particles in the air of where I was, I'll let you see that. And when he passes before him, what does God say? He says, the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty? God is abounding in steadfast love, mercy, and faithfulness. He will not sweep sin under the rug like some of you do when your parents tell you with the dust in your house you sweep it under the rug. God will not sweep sin under the rug, but he is gracious and he is merciful. Look with me at the latter half of verse 4, because of the great love with which he loved us. Well, what is this great love? How do I get that? Where is that? What's the love that Paul has talked about earlier in Ephesians? Ephesians 1, verses 5 and 6, Paul writes, he says, in love. He, that is God, predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. God has loved you in Christ before the foundation of the earth. Before you were a twinkle in your great, 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 great granddaddy's eye, he had loved you. And he knew you. This is the love that Paul writes of. Notice also that God loves us in spite of us. He doesn't love us because we are awesome. That's how the gospel is perverted in today's culture. We don't, right, that, that people will just say, hey, God just loves you so much. He has a wonderful plan for your life. Would you please just do God the favor of, of asking him into your heart? I don't know what any of that means. What I do know is that I was dead in my sins and trespasses and Christ made me alive in God, right? Even When we were dead in our trespasses. Even when you were hell bent on riding the highway to hell. God loved you. When you were a drunk in the ditch. When you were imprisoned. When you were addicted to alcohol. When you were out having sexual trysts that you ought not to. Christ loved you. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, he loved us. He loved us in spite of us. Not only did he love us in spite of us, but he gave us life. 
even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, Christ made us alive together with Christ. He redeemed us from the gutter. We were as Gomer was in Hosea chapter 3. We were the harlot that went back into harlotry. And where did Hosea go to find his wife? To the gutter. Christ came and found you and he found me. And I was not nice, neat, and put together. I was enslaved to sin. My parents are right there. You can ask both of them. Neither of them had to teach me how to lie. I hope you never had to teach your children how to lie. If you did, keep that to yourself. You shouldn't be proud of that, right? You, you don't have to teach your children to lie, to be angry, to hit another kid. Why? They do it naturally because we are depraved. And yet, when we were that way, Christ made us alive. And he finishes this verse. It says, by grace you have been saved. It is, as, it, is, it is as if Paul cannot contain himself. Because he's going to get to the whole purpose of what he means by by grace you have been saved. But he just has to let it out. By grace you have been saved. It is the unmerited favor of God that brings any man, woman, or child to salvation. You are saved by grace. Not only that, but man is raised up and seated with Christ. He is made alive and he is raised up and seated with Christ. Look with me at verse 6. It says, And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places, in Christ Jesus. He raised us up from the grave. We were dead. He made us alive. We were raised up. Right? Jesus tells Nicodemus about this in John chapter 3 when he tells him that he must be born again. You must be made alive. And this is what Christ has done. He has made us alive. He raised us up, but not only has he raised us up, but he has also seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. It speaks to our, what we would call our union with Christ. That in Christ we are in union with him, saved. And it is inseparable. Paul puts it this way when he writes to the Colossians in Colossians 3, 3, For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Brothers and sisters, your life is hidden in Christ with God. Think about that for a moment. Think about that. Everything here on this earth, all the wonderful things that we enjoy because of the freedoms we have, even the good things pales in comparison to what we have in Christ. Jesus told his disciples, right? Do not seek to amass for yourselves treasures on heaven or on earth where moth and rust destroy. Rather, seek the treasures that are above where neither moth nor rust will destroy. Why? Because that is where our life is hidden, in Christ, with God. We also see that man is saved for the display of God's grace. Look with me at verse 7. So that, so, right, meaning because of, so that, so the purpose of, so that in the coming ages... He might show the immeasurable riches of His grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Why does God save sinners? For this purpose. Sinners are saved to display before all creation now and for the rest of eternity the immeasurable riches of God's grace and kindness 
in Christ Jesus. God saves us to exalt Himself. And that is good news. Right? Who does God love the most? God loves God the most. Why? Because if He loves someone else more than Himself, He would be an idolater. And so God, for His own purposes, saves men, women, and children to display the glory of His mercy and His goodness and His kindness. And this is why our song for all of eternity will be that which we see in Revelation 5.12. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Hallelujah. Man is saved for the display of God's grace. But notice here in verses 8 and 9 that man is saved by grace alone. Verse 8, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is a gift. It is the gift of God. Not a result of works so that no man may boast. You are saved by grace through faith. This is why the Protestant Reformation was so important. Because by the time 1517 rolls around, the gospel had been veiled and perverted and there was no understanding that you are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, to the glory of God alone. Paul says, you are saved by grace And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. You couldn't earn it. You can't work for it. You can't return the price that was paid for it. All you can do is walk in light of it because you have received it. It is not your own doing. You are saved by grace through faith. This is why it is so dangerous to get away from it. Because for several decades, centuries, there we go. You got ten hundreds, thousands, anyway. Um, For several centuries, the gospel was veiled. What Right, over time, the church spread, right? We see this throughout the book of Acts. It spreads to all the earth. And, right, when the Bible ends, right, you have history textbooks and they're helpful. They're not inspired like the Bible, but they're helpful. And we see the church spread and move and change and, and, and what happens. And towards the end of the, I believe it's fifth century, we see what begins to take shape of what will now be known as the Roman Catholic Church. And while I love our Roman Catholic friends and I love our Mormon friends and I love our Jehovah's Witness friends, they preach a false gospel. They do not teach that you are saved by grace alone, through faith alone. They say it is grace plus works. Roman Catholicism teaches that they baptize infants to wash away the stain of original sin, and yet we will stumble and fall. Therefore, you must partake of the seven sacraments, the mass, confession, marriage, etc., to receive more grace, to elevate yourself back up to the place of cleanliness. You can't really go to Jesus in prayer, so we're going to pray to Mary because Jesus is a little Stonewall Jackson and he can't resist his mama's heart, so we pray to Mary, which is blasphemous. We are never commanded to pray to Mary. And then Jesus, from Mary to Jesus, will go to the Father to perhaps give you more grace. What have we done there? We have added works. Where is grace? Well, that's a part of it. 
No, that's it. You are saved by grace alone. Through faith alone. The Bible tells us over and over and over again, if you confess with your lips that Jesus is the Christ and that God raised him from the dead, if you believe that in your heart, you will be saved. That's it. No works. You cannot do anything to add to it. Christ has done it all. Not a result of works, so that no man may boast. It has been said before that the only thing that you and I have done to contribute to our salvation was the sin that made it necessary. Faith, the gift of God. Repentance, the gift of God. Walking in obedience, the power of God as the gift of God. God does the whole work and he receives all the glory. Man receives no glory. We will give it back to God. We will bow down and worship him because he receives the praise. That's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1.31, let the one who boasts Boast in the Lord. And so if we were to take it back to the Fort Lauderdale question in evangelism explosion, understanding we are saved by grace alone through faith alone, right? That, that question that you're all familiar with, right? If you stood before God tonight and He asked you why He should let you into the gates of heaven, what is the answer you would give? That's right, brother. You see, if we answer that in the first person, we've gone off. We've missed the mark. Because I? Really? Well, because I believed. I had faith. I did this. I did that. I went to church. I was a member at First Baptist Bridge City. No, no, no. The only answer is in the third person. Because he... Because He, Jesus, paid it all. All to Him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Lastly, man is set apart to exalt the name of Jesus Christ. Look at verse 10 with me. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. He says we are his handiwork. We are molded and crafted and made new in Christ. Right? Paul puts it this way in Romans 8, 29. He says, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined, for what purpose? To be conformed to the image of his Son in order that he might, excuse me, be the firstborn among many brothers. We are his handiwork. We are being sanctified. We are being made more and more and more like Christ. We are God's handiwork. Not only are we his handiwork, but we are his handiwork for what purpose? We are set apart for good works that we should walk in them. That's great. But what is the purpose of our good works? Why do we do good works? Not for the sake of making much of ourselves. Right? We don't go feed the homeless to make and boast in us. We do it to magnify Christ. To exalt Jesus. Right, and see, this is why James, in his epistle, makes such a hard and fast point that faith and works are inseparable. Right, James says, you have faith, but I have works. I will show you my faith by my works. Why? Because he understood this, that we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. 
good works, the good things that we do are for the exaltation of Christ. They are the fruit that God produces in our hearts that have been made new. Well, what does that look like? Do I just have to go feed the homeless? Or, or what? what? What is it? What's all that you do? Sometimes it's ordinary faithfulness. Right, Paul puts it this way in 1 Corinthians 10.31. He says, so whether, what, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. One of my favorite people in all of history is Arthur Guinness. He's the dude that makes Guinness beer, or you might be familiar with um, the Guinness Book of World Records. The second time I'm mentioning alcohol in a Baptist... Anyway, right? Uh, anyway, wh- whatever your, your stance on alcohol is, right? Um, Arthur Guinness was an ordinary man, living an ordinary life, and yet God used him in great ways. And it's a shame that we don't think or talk about him very much, and, and many people don't even know who he is. They just know the beer in the cooler at Walmart. But Arthur Guinness was an ordinary man doing ordinary things, and in God's providence, he... Um, came upon some money and he, he worked hard. He, he honed a craft, right? They didn't have all the fancy gizmos today to make beer. And so he developed his craft by sniffing, tasting, doing whatever he did. I don't know what goes into making beer, all of it, but right. But he did that well. And not only did he do that, but he did mighty things for Christ. You see, without Arthur Guinness... Sunday school would not have been implemented in in Ireland. He gave direct funds to help establish the first Sunday schools in Ireland. Not only that, but he advocated for religious liberty. He said, I disagree with our Roman Catholic friends, but I love them and they have every right to practice their religion as they see fit. We can disagree but we're not going to ban them from doing it. Not only did he do that, but he raised his children in the fear and admonition of Christ. He taught them his skill, his craft, and they continued his legacy, but he told them about Jesus. And one of his grandchildren, Oz Guinness, would eventually go into the ministry, and from Oz Guinness, he had an extremely long lineage of clergy members. That perhaps goes to present day. I don't know if it does or not, but it was at least um, several generations. Ordinary faithfulness. Doing anything and everything for the glory of God. And so today we have seen the two states of man. We have seen that man, we have seen the state of man apart from Christ. And we have also seen the state of man in Christ. So what do we do with this? Briefly, and then we'll be done. To you, believer, become more acquainted with Christ Jesus. Know Him. Read of Him. Worship Him. Exalt Him in all of your life. And teach others about Christ. Right? Faith comes by hearing and hearing of the Word of God. Let's be honest, nobody cares if they see your SUV pulling into FBC Bridge City. They really don't. They don't care that they see my truck here. Except for my dad. He drives around this area. He's like, hey, you're at work. Cool. You're not skipping. Right? Um, but they really don't. That's why we have to tell them. Tell them that we have been made new. That they can be made new. That they can receive life. Parents, teach your children about Christ. Because if you think that dropping them off with me for two hours in a given week is sufficient to bring them to salvation, it is not. We hear the statistics that 70 to 80% of students, by the time they graduate high school, will leave the church and have nothing more to do with it. And everybody wants to ask, well, how do we get the 80% back? I think that's the wrong question. The question is, who is the 20 to 30% who stayed? Well, when you ask 
other student ministers, who are they? They are the children who were discipled by their parents in their home or who were basically living with the student pastor and being discipled in their home or by a grandparent, whoever. Discipleship begins in the home, and that's a whole other sermon. We won't go there, but t- tell your children, tell your friends, your neighbors about all that God has done for you. And to you, if you have not believed in Jesus, if you are presently dead in your sins and your trespasses, I plead with you. Do you not see the mercy and the grace that is in Jesus Christ? He is the eternal Son of God that in the fullness of time took on human flesh. He was born of the Virgin Mary, lived a sinless and spotless life. John the Baptist proclaimed him as, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And he lived the life that we could not live because if we're honest, when we look at the Ten Commandments, we don't measure up. But Jesus kept them perfectly. And yet he was numbered with the criminals. And they beat him and they scorned him and they spit in his face. They put the crossbeam upon his back and marched him to Golgotha where they crucified him. And he bled and he died, but he did not stay dead. Though he was in the grave three days, he rose again, triumphant over death, over sin. And the Bible tells us, if you will believe in him, you will have life. You will be made new. And so if that is you today, I plead with you, turn to Jesus. Experience the grace of God in your own life. Turn from sin and believe on Jesus. You don't have to walk the aisle to receive Jesus. You don't have to come talk to me. But believe on Jesus. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you that your word is true. Father, we thank you that though we were dead in our sins and our trespasses, that you were rich in mercy and eager to redeem sinners to yourself. Father, may we never lose sight of that. That we would remember who we were apart from Christ and that it would cause us to bow down and worship you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you are here this morning and you need to make any kind of decision, if you need prayer, I'll be down here. Like I said, you don't have to come down and talk to me to receive Christ. You can receive Christ right there in the pew before you. But if you need to come, come as the Lord leads.